Hello and welcome to lecture 10 in electrochemistry. Today we're going to look at corrosion. Of course these are the knowledge outcomes prescribed by Alberta Learning. These form the basis of the bulk of the diploma exam questions that you'll see at the end of the year. Um, hopefully you're referring back to this page from time to time to get a sense of how well you're progressing in the unit. Um, we've seen that the industrial process of refining metals into their pure state is called smelting. Um, we take the metal from its naturally occurring oxidized state and reduce it to its elemental form. And you'll notice in the reaction that uh, the oxidation state of the, the iron in this case goes from plus 3 to 0. So we're introducing electrons to it by reducing it. Corrosion can be viewed as the opposite process. It's the process of oxidizing metals to their natural state or to their oxide ore. Um, An environmental corrosion is driven by the following half reaction, which we'll, we'll see in our data booklet in a minute. The overall redox reaction for the corrosion of iron in the general atmosphere looks like this. So at the cathode, oxygen and water are reacting to form hydroxide, and at the anode, um, iron is being oxidized um, to the iron 2 ion. The net redox reaction looks like this. Um, th this environmental oxidizer, this half reaction, is found in your standard reduction potentials table in your data booklet. And here's the page. And the reaction is right here at uh, positive 0 0.40 volts. Let's blow that up a little. So this is the environment and its uh, environmentally corrosive effects. Um, in fact, it'll corrode any and all the materials found in the bottom right side in the reduction table. So all of these reagents here, all of these metals and various other substances will lose electrons to the general environment, a combination of oxygen and water. Um, there are problems associated with this. Metals, for example, when they're oxidized, it can cause a loss in their structural integrity. Um, however, most common metals, thankfully, develop a thin, tightly packed oxide coating, which is tough for water to penetrate. Um, what this coating does is it protects the internal atoms against further environmental corrosion. However, uh, an unfortunate exception to this rule is iron. Iron forms a loose, flaky oxide material that, that chips off the metal, exposing further metal to, um, to be oxidized, uh, to be rusted, if you'd like. So we, we often see iron rusted straight through the metal. As for other metals, uh, even though they might uh, develop this thin, tightly packed coating, um, it could chip off or scratch and leave new metal to be exposed for further corrosion. Um, the presence of ionic salts in the environment, which of course we spread liberally on the roadways in the winter, um, speed up uh, environmental oxidation. They, they act as a salt bridge, so they, they essentially complete the voltaic cell in nature. And here we see iron exposed to the elements and um, water droplet uh, um, falls on the iron surface and of course it's got dissolved oxygen in it so that's our combination of oxidizers oxygen and water so electrons flow from the iron metal to, which is the reducing agent to the water droplet which is the oxidizing agent and uh, our, the metal becomes depleted of electrons it becomes oxidized or also known as rusted Um, there are several methods of corrosion protection that uh, we look at. The first of these is perhaps the simplest method. It's a barrier method. Essentially, you apply a coating of a paint to the metal to protect it from being oxidized. So you prevent the environment from having access to the metal. Another method called galvanization is a combination barrier method combined with another method. Galvanization is to coat a metal with another metal such as zinc, tin, or chrome. Uh, the metal coating must be a stronger reducing agent than the underlying metal that's being protect, protected. And the idea there is the, the coating metal will be oxidized first. 
uh, because it's a stronger reducing agent, and it'll form that thin, tough oxide, oxide layer that we referred to earlier in the discussion, protecting uh, the underlying metal. Uh, and I've explained that here. The coating metal will oxidize uh, instead of the underlying layer, and it'll form this in thin, impenetrable, impenetrable layer on the surface, protecting the underlying iron. Um, uh, because the coating is is being oxidized, it's being in a, in a manner of speaking, it's being sacrificed to protect the underlying metal, um, and th this is typically called a, a sacrificial anode method. So galvanization is sort of a, a, a combination method. It's a barrier method, and it's also a sacrificial anode method. Cathodic protection is another method used to protect iron in steel in steel and iron structures such as ocean growing vessels, buried uh, fuel tanks, and pipelines. A chunk of a stronger reducing agent, like magnesium, is connected to the iron, either directly or by an unreactive wire. And the magnesium in this case is a sacrificial anode. Again, it's the strongest reducer in the system, so it'll be oxidized by the environment uh, before, uh, completely before the iron's oxidized. Uh, and we, we sort of spell that out here. Instead of the iron being corroded, the more reactive metal uh, will, corro will be corroded first. And in point of fact, the iron can uh, oxidize the magnesium or other, uh, or other stronger reducers as well, um, forcing the iron to act as a cathode. And uh, as we've seen, the spontaneous redox reaction is between the strongest reducing agent and the strongest oxidizing agent. So if the environment is the strongest oxidizing agent available, uh, the magnesium or any other sacrificial metal that you, you choose will be the only uh, metal that's oxidized until it's completely gone. Because the spontaneous redox is between the strongest oxidizer and the strongest reducing agent. So as often as not on these uh, massive iron and steel structures, you see them replacing uh, the magnesium once it's been oxidized throughout or replacing the zinc once it's been oxidized throughout um, because it's it sort of lived its useful purpose and has to be replaced. Cathodic protection, of course, does not give the barrier protection that galvanizing does, but it's, it's common and it's relatively inexpensive in terms of corrosion protection. Um, alternatively, a power supply can be connected to the iron structure. And if you think about it, uh, the environment, oxidizing agents want electrons. So if you supply them a, a free current of electrons, um, uh, you, you can uh, set the, the current up such that they, they'll be preferred to the, the electrons that um, they can strip off the iron. And um, you see this in new cars. Many of them, they're bodies and their frames are wired up to um, a very low level uh, electrical current and it helps to protect the body and the frame from being rusted. We call this an impressed current and it's another method of corrosion protection. Alloying is a method of uh, mixing metals um, and so we alloy pure metals uh, to change their reduction potentials to improve their resistance to corrosion. Stainless steel, for example, is an alloy. It contains a mixture of iron, chromium, and nickel. And it, it changes the steel's reduction potential to one characteristic of the noble metals. And we were introduced to the noble metals in my first lecture in this unit. Um, silver, gold, and platinum, and they're extremely difficult to oxidize, which is why they're called noble metals. So to give steel the characteristics of a noble metal is to uh, all but prevent it from ever being corroded. And again, as we've seen, gold is, is um, virtually unreactive in redox systems. It can't be corroded except under the most extreme of conditions. And that's the end of my lecture. I hope you found value in that. I refer you to any homework that you receive from your teacher, and we'll see you again next time when we talk about uh, electrochemical stoichiometry. Thank you.